Welcome, welcome to this week's edition of our weekly chat, Just Two Dads. And if you're looking, you'll see that there's just one dad here today. Uh, Brian is um, not with us today, but I'm sure he'll be watching the show when he gets a chance as well. And uh, for those of you joining us uh, for the first time, what we generally do is just have conversations from the perspective of not just being a dad, but uh, as a parent to um, a child or um, um, with, with special needs in any varying category and trying to make sure that we just add value to people's time, uh, people that are new to a diagnosis, um, various aspects of life, um, living with someone, living with and loving um, someone with special needs, raising someone with special needs, any way, shape or form that we can add value. And I'm really excited about our guest today because she brings what is interesting. I'm going to say a different perspective but it's different based on my perspective. I'm sure there's other people out there who, um, for whom at least some of her experience may fit, but there's gonna be people out there who, um, uh, for who that does not fit and find it fascinating. She has a tremendous story and uh, she is um, in uh, up in Canada. Her husband is on the autism spectrum as are her children. So, you know, I, I always tell people, anyone that has a conversation with me will know at some point, I like to say that we're never going to be as young as we were when this conversation began. So I always hope to add some value to it. And I think that our guest today will do just that. Please help me welcome Rebecca Campbell. Hi, Sean. Thank Hi, you. how are you? Very good, thanks. How are you? I am doing great, great, great to have you with us. So um, if you can, tell us a little bit about your story, your neurotypical, not on the autism spectrum. So uh, tell us a little bit about um, your story, um, you know, where you come from, how you grew up and leading up to, of course, how you and your husband met and what this whole ride and journey has meant for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my, like you said, my husband is on the spectrum as well as my two children. I have a son and a daughter. My daughter is 14 and my son is 18. Mm -hmm. um, Met my husband, oh, geez, 25 years ago or or then some, working together in the restaurant industry. Uh, we were both restaurant managers. Um, at that time, I would say I probably didn't have a lot of knowledge of autism and what autism was. Um, and it certainly wasn't uh, a thought or a concern having met my husband. He was the life of the party, um, hilarious, no filter. Uh, mm -hmm. Kept me laughing all the time. Um, very charming and charismatic. And uh, yeah, just simply him. And a lot of those qualities that um, I fell in love with are actually probably very similar or uh, recognized autism traits. Mm. So um, having said that, um, my daughter was diagnosed on the spectrum at age seven and my son was 15. Mm -hmm. uh, when we had my daughter assessed, um, late diagnoses are very are very common with females. Um, mm -hmm. They kind of mask um, autism a little differently or even better than boys, I would say. I didn't even know. Uh, so she always appeared happy, like a happy girl, but would, um, would show indicators at home otherwise. Um, so when we had her assessed at seven, um, the pediatrician after the assessment suggested that we um, were asked if we would be interested in doing genetic testing uh, for her, just so the geneticist could better understand her or autism as a whole. Um, and this is at a time. This is at a time where she was diagnosed, but your and your son was as well. No, not yet. She was the first. She's the youngest okay. in the family and the first to be diagnosed. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. Um, keep in mind, she's very um, academically inclined, um, somewhat social, um, however, no filter whatsoever, and uh, a lot of anxiety. Mm, okay. um, so those were some of the main triggers for us. I mean, there was a lot of other traits that to me, I, I picked up on from the time she was an infant, but it really wasn't until we thought, okay, we need to address the situation to maybe get the proper supports that we actually pushed through to get that assessment mm -hmm. for her. Right. Um, so she, yeah, she was seven, did genetic counseling after the assessment and mm -hmm. it came back showing two identical um, 
or sorry, two chromosome inversions. Mm. And I'm not a geneticist, I'm not a doctor, so I don't totally understand all this. Um, but what I understand, they were pretty satisfied knowing that she was on the spectrum with those right. results. Um, and then out of curiosity, they asked the pediatrician to request that my husband and I do the, gen do the genetic testing. Mm -hmm. and so we did that. And uh, um, we were like, for sure. And uh, through the course of waiting, you know, we had lots of giggles, you know, I'd be like, well, I'm smarter or um, I'm more neurotic and let's, let's see who's, who we can pin this on. Right. So right. Um, yeah, we got a, a letter back from the geneticist not, not long after stating that my husband had the same identical two chromosome inversions. Wow. Um, which we, which everybody kind of classically thought as, well, that makes sense. You know, he must be on the spectrum. Yeah. Um, more recently, we had a proper psychologist do an assessment, and it did come back. Um, you know, stating that he was on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it was something we knew from the time she was young, like my daughter was seven. Right. Um, however, having it confirmed through a proper assessment wasn't uh, until more recently. Right. Um, but none of, none of the, none of that surprised me. Um, my husband and daughter are very similar. Um, what irritates one would irritate the other. <laughs> um, very, very structured and orderly and, um, yeah, no, so that's that. And then with my son, he was 15, and my son um, didn't exude as, like, the same sort of traits as my daughter. Right. There was a lot of things that he did as a younger child or growing up that it was really clear, even before my daughter was assessed, I, I assumed or I felt in my heart that he was on the spectrum. Right. And, um, the difference was is... Um, he could do what was more socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, he would respond more appropriately to everyday things. It wasn't really a concern. And the th one thing we said to him after everybody else has had their diagnosis is like, he's always welcome to have an assessment done if he feels it's necessary, but because he does so well academically, right. um, if there's a concern or some reasons to needing an assessment, we would do that. Um, as he was in, in high school, I think he really recognized some of his social struggles, social struggles, mm -hmm. along with um, challenges at school, for instance, you know, sitting in a quiet space writing an exam would be beneficial. And he knew he wouldn't really have access to a lot of that stuff unless his IEP stated that he was on the spectrum. So he he opted at that time to have the the assessment done. And that wasn't a surprise when it came back that he was on the spectrum. We We just kind of knew he was, yeah. um, but it wasn't until we really felt like, like he could benefit from some of the resources and services available right. that we thought we would do that. And, and then he could start advocating for himself too. So, okay. now, how old is he now? 18. 18. Wow. Wow. Okay. And then he was, and if, forgive me, cause I'm taking it all in. He was how old when he was diagnosed? 15. 15. Okay. So yeah. considering that, um, well, what, are the, what I was going to ask you is what kind of services were available? Because here in the States, someone yeah. that has a child that is diagnosed um, going back 10 years plus has, I always say to those parents, they're even more warriors uh, because we, we have to advocate for our children. Your role as a parent is a protector. Yes. 10 times more so when there's a special needs component. And the yeah. further back you go in time, the more of an advocate and a warrior one needs to be because the services that were available uh, that yeah. are available now were not as plentiful back then. And here in, yeah. in Southern California, there's more of them available than other parts of the country. What type of services um, are available free of charge that one has access to uh, where you are in Canada? And if you can tell everyone, where in Canada are you? I'm on the West Coast. I'm in the Okanagan um considered um canada's or bc's uh wine country it's compared to okay, a lot so british columbia yep yeah. okay. um so going back to your question i was just thinking what resources yeah. were made available mm -hmm. um well 
the, the nice thing in BC is if you have a child that's diagnosed on the spectrum, um, you can apply for uh, the provincial um, autism funding, which is, which is a certain amount of funds that you have access to every year. Whether or not you use it is up to you, but you can use it on services, support, whether that's therapies, psychology, really? um, going, you know, conferences, or you can use it. There's a certain portion of that amount that you can use on equipment. Um, so if you needed a computer for your child, it would help benefit them socially, communicate, you know, to communicate better. Mm -hmm. um, you can apply for that and use some of your funding towards that or a weighted blanket for that matter. Wow. So Which you have that. But when I was referring to my son and services, I wasn't really meaning like, you know, um, there wasn't anything like a therapeutic toy. I think that he would benefit. It was more about um, being able to have access to any accommodations necessary at school, for instance. Okay. One of the biggest challenges is crowds and noise, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, we had recently moved to a new school and for instance, there was, um, you know, way more kids than he was ever used to from our old school. Um, he was overwhelmed, especially during breaks, going to and from classes. Mm -hmm. The number of people, the people bouncing into him, touching him as they brush by, yeah. just standing in the hallway, not going places. So having a diagnosis and having that on his IEP, for instance, enabled us to say, hey, listen, let's make his life at school better, right? And give him five minutes leeway. So mm -hmm. he could chill out until the hallways were cleared and then go to the next class. Right. Without being reprimanded for being late. That was just the deal with him. Right. Right. That helped his day so much. I think a lot of the times we forget how hard being outside a comfort zone uh, for a child on the spectrum can be. Mm -hmm. And every little thing can add up. And so when they're at school, the hardest thing to do is learn because they have so many other factors. Right. Uh, making it challenging. The, the lighting, the noise, the people, it's overwhelming, right? It can be very overwhelming. Right. So just having that ability to say, you know what, let's give him a five minute leeway. Um, something so small made a huge difference in his daily life. Right, right. Those are the kinds of things that he needed, that he knew that would help him function better. What was that like? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I mean, up until that point, all through elementary, I mean, we didn't have any, he didn't have any support. Mm, okay. services. The other thing was is getting removed from the school during exams. He didn't necessarily need extra time. He was fine for that, but he needed no distractions. Um, that just, just made it really difficult to focus any extra right. noise. Right. Mm -hmm. So now stuff Minor stuff like that for him. Yeah. Yeah. My, minor things, little things that have a big um, impact. And oh, yeah. um, you, so we've had uh, a guest on here, um, uh, Georgiana uh, Junko Kelman, who is an attorney here in Los Angeles um, and advocates on a regular basis for um, children uh, with uh, the local school district uh, here in Los Angeles. And so, you know, depending on the district that one is in, um, those things can be fairly easy to come by. You know, our kids are in a, a smaller district. They've been uh, fair, uh, very accommodating. Uh, but I know some people that have had some battles as well. How difficult was it for you? And and do you know what it's like there? Um, do you have any idea what other people's experiences have been like trying to get the accommodations that uh, that are needed in school? Yeah, no, I, I'm not an expert. Um, but all through Canada and all the different provinces, they all have different regulations and, and different things that are available and not available. I do know a lot of the support services throughout the country are being pulled. So a lot of people are really struggling to get the proper help, um, whether it be therapies at a young age uh, with the funding. Um, right. and, and I'm sure you can imagine the expense of going private. So yeah. um, I know a lot of people are really struggling. I'm in a situation where I didn't necessarily need a lot of those services. Mm -hmm. um, and even with my daughter, it was kind of late for a lot of, um, you know, um, behavioral therapies and stuff like that. Because of her age, she was pretty reluctant and resistant to a lot of the right. stuff that would have been beneficial if she was younger. Um, right. But that came with having a later diagnosis. 
Right, right. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I find myself in British Columbia really fortunate mm -hmm. um, for the services we're provided. Mm, okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Getting back to the funding that you were referring to, everyone has access to, and this might be a little further, yeah. um, you know, outside your wheelhouse, I don't know, but how do they determine the amount that someone gets? And then just out of curiosity, let's say you've got, I don't know, $5,000 for the year. Yeah. If you, if at the end of the year, you haven't exhausted all of those funds, does it carry over into the next year as well? No, no. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will use the majority of their funding for therapies, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, if you don't use it all, it, it, it just goes. Um, and I, I, you know, I think I'm a lot, a lot of parents not really knowing how to use, utilize things. And at first, I mean, I know I had a good couple of years um, not utilizing my funding at all because I didn't right. know how, because uh, right. it, it's not easy. <laughs> And, right. and, and you can be denied certain things. You know, we've put in applications for certain things thinking, you know, well, let's just see if that gets approved. I remember there was about four years where my daughter didn't get off of a trampoline. And I thought, well, that's therapy. And it, yeah. it helped her with exercise. And she would just be on it all the time. And, you know, that's a small example. I tried applying for a trampoline and I got quickly denied because it's not really a necessity, which I appreciate for most. But my child lived on it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it helps. We've we've gone through um we're on our, our second one, which is yeah. a little more durable because you know my son is 14 now and everything and he doesn't use it as often as he used to, but it goes it, it goes a long way and it does it, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. No, and they have they have certain uh, protocols in place that you know you can you can apply for you know um, some technology whether it's an iPad, but you don't you can't apply again for anything like that for three years. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. you're trying to keep people from abusing the system, right? Right, right. Uh, and if and if it, if it's something that you've applied for and it goes over your funding about you know amount that's allotted to ex like um, equipment. Because you only get a small fraction of that that goes to the equipment. Most of it goes towards services. Right, 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 right. right. So, okay. You know, but for us, it's, it's allowed us to, you know, my son sees a psychologist regularly. Right. Um, and, and we've been able to maintain that and not worry about that stress financially. Right. Um, which is really nice. Right, right. Uh, the, um, one of the, one of our frequent viewers is a, a gentleman by the name of Robert, uh, who is in, and I, who is in the, the U S Virgin islands where I'm from originally, we went to school together in fourth grade and then again in ninth grade. So it's many years ago, but he just posted a question, which I think goes in a little bit of the direction that I wanted to, which is he's asking, how do we educate the populace towards the needs of all uh, people with needs uh, to be more compassionate and understanding? I think that, you know, um, the answer to that, at least, you know, in the past has come from some of the guests that we've had on. I think that that's something that everybody thinks about. I mm -hmm. think the answer to that as it relates to you goes to some of what you and I spoke about uh, earlier off camera in terms of seeking a purpose. And so tell us a little bit about that. Cause when someone is faced with any um, loved one that has special needs, you know, you become this, you know, a, a warrior and at the same time wanting to be understood. And as you evolve, trying to seek some kind of understanding from other people as well. So some of your purpose, I think, um, lends itself to teaching people um, how to be compassionate. And uh, yeah. so if you will, tell us a little bit about uh, about that. <laughs> well, for personally, I think it's by leading by example, for one. Mm -hmm. um, we can teach a lot of people around us by the way we, re we react and behave and explain things. I always have gone forward um, with my children or in the past experiences with anyone with special needs, very honestly. Um, I think, you know, in the, in the past, people are afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I try to answer questions before I even, you know, people have to worry about asking them. Right. Um, I think knowledge is power with anything in life. Right. Um, you know, one of um, my son and I have been working on a little, um, book for like preschool grade in kindergarten students. And the whole point of our book is to teach neurodiversity right. at a very young age, because what I believe 
is it's what we were taught from the get go. So, you know, um, perfect example is, you know, I get them at an early age and just talk about things. I remember in college, my best friend lost her hand in a meat grinder. Oh my gosh. Right. So, so I remember the first couple of days at school, I found myself kind of checking her out and, and my eyes would be drawn to her arm naturally. And I finally like, you know, I can't, I can't, I need to know, you know? So I finally, I said, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. Can you just tell me what happened? Right. And right. I mean, we became best of friends after that. She told me what happened and I was over it. It was like, okay, I didn't need to look at it anymore. The curiosity yeah. was gone. So my right. thing is, is if we can teach kids young, um, you know, why so-and-so is wearing headphones in kindergarten class. It's because of this and because of that. Right. Maybe, maybe instead of having um, a negative thought or weird thinking, they're just like, oh, yeah, so-and-so, it's distracted by the noise. No big deal. Right. I think right. if we teach our kids early, that that could be really helpful. You know, it, it's like yeah. we're ignorant. We just don't know any better. But why yes, not yes. teach them to know better, yeah. right? You Most know, definitely. why is so-and-so -so jumping all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, one, he's really happy. And two, maybe he needs to let out some energy or whatever it is if they're stemming. Yes. Um, taking yes. that, yes. taking the, the question out of their head and answering it for them mm -hmm. takes so much of, you know, what could turn into a negative um behavior or treating our child or somebody else's child differently or not so nicely. Right. We understand things. We're, we're good with it. Yeah. I think there's, um, there's so many examples of that. Uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, um, my, uh, my nephew, when I was, um, well, my wife and I were, um, I think we, we, we weren't, I don't think we were married yet. We were dating. And um, I, I, you know, my wife is um, is uh, Mexican American, and her nephew happened to my hair was not this short; it wasn't cut this short. And um, her sister's son, he was I don't know exactly how old he was, but he happened to touch my hair, and he says, and he goes, Sean, he goes, your hair, your hair feels like paper, and I just I laughed, and I loved that because it, it showed that he just hadn't had experience touching the hair of anyone that was african-american or that was you know black or african and then you know i always say that if we can that that's the classic example if we can be child like and not child ish yeah then that's the that that's the answer yeah. and then to, to further answer robert's question you know we've had someone uh one of our guests from our previous episodes was a, a young lady who started a um a business that teaches businesses and business owners to be more compassionate and how to interact with uh, people on the autism spectrum specifically. And that came about when she was at a restaurant where both you, I'm sure you can relate as well, used to have people staring when your kid, your child has a, you know, a meltdown or um, is just behaving a little differently. And in her case, they were asked to leave the restaurant and yeah. she, she just thought, you know what, I need to write that wrong somehow. And we can never have too much of that. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways um, that we can do something about that. So I don't know how often you're asked this, and this is the part that I'm the most curious about, just because I wonder, you know, what does uh, my son's future hold? Um, is, you know, he's, is he high functioning? He is in some ways, but I was wondering what, what does the future hold for him in terms of relationships and experiences and, uh, and love and potentially marriage? So what was it? What is and was it like being married to someone that is on the spectrum, especially obviously uh, where within the spectrum your husband falls? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, we have uh, tons of friends and family who never saw this coming or or could imagine it. And that's just because um, when we were younger, you know, um, having autism diagnosed wasn't as common um he was more add or more adhd not the full spectrum right um, so there wasn't a lot of knowledge about it for a lot of people um so I, I i wouldn't say myself included there was anything at the beginning of the relationship or for or for years for that matter that said to me oh he's clearly on the spectrum mm -hmm. 
But when it all came to fruition with my daughter and getting her diagnosis and then having the testing, I think both of us did a lot of thinking and like, I'm like, oh, a lot of these things, a lot of our challenges and struggles in a relationship, maybe our difficulties communicating, everything made sense. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of redundant arguments that never, ever, you know, progressed or went anywhere. Um, and I think personally over years, I, I learned, you know, what I was going to um, put my energy into, uh, what I was going to go to bat with and, and really argue with or um, debate over. Some things just became not worth it. And they would, and it was just because they're one way thinking mm -hmm. <laughs> to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, but every, everything totally made sense. Um, yeah, him and my daughter are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she keeps us laughing uh, with what comes out of her mouth. That's for sure. Right. Uh, right. But yeah, there, there wasn't anything in particular at the time that I thought, oh, he, he's on the spectrum. But I will tell you that I, I can't, I, I think most people want love and relationships in their life. And that may look differently for everybody, right? Right. I think what we expect isn't necessarily going to be what's going to happen mm -hmm. with our children. Um, it's hard to tell. You know, I have, um, yeah, I have uh, big hopes for my, my children for what they want in their life. Right. 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 I think that's, that's what we have to kind of teach ourselves to think. We think that everybody wants to be in a, in a relationship and everybody wants to be married and that's not always the case right true true, true. yeah um and so like we have a choice though it, you know what it, i would love for my kids to end up in relationships and have somewhat typical lives when they're older um but more importantly right. i just want them happy you know what whatever that right. means and um right. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I often think to myself, you know, with my children, do they connect like I do? Do they feel like I do? Do they long like, you know, like I do for touch and feel? I don't think they have the same, I don't think they have the same desires. I wonder about that too, yeah. I know exactly what you mean, because sometimes and, you want to try and get in their and, head to figure out, I want to understand so bad. So we think they're missing out on things, but they're not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Very very interesting perspective. I've never I've never said that the way you just did in that they're not. The closest I've come to that though is I'm like, I'm wondering. I know what's important to me, but yeah. how important is that to yes. you? And, yeah. and, and, and my wife will say the same thing. And and we we vary in terms of where each of us is at. You know, sometimes there have been times where we're both like, Well, you know how he is with such and such, so you don't try anything. And then there's times when one or both of us is like, well, you know, we never know. You put something in front of them and you always try because you always because as a parent, the first thing you want to do is introduce your child to the things that you like. You know, as a dad, maybe it's your favorite <laughs> sports team or your favorite recording artist, or your favorite whatever. Yeah. And you want to because even most of our this is a whole another direction, but most of our religions are not even our own. Yeah. For most of us, that's what put up. That's what's put upon us by our parents for the best of intention. Yeah. But yeah. still, nevertheless, something not something that you make of your own. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit, if you will, because most of the people that are um, that are our guests have some sort of if there isn't a full blown business or professional um, accreditation or something like that, that goes along with their purpose that is tied to special needs. There's something that they do. Um, and you're you're no different. And I, I think you're like me in that you try to see the good in things and you try to feel that, okay, if something is happening, um, as most people would think happening to them, I need to stop and think, how is it happening for me? So there's obviously benefits to um, mm -hmm. living with and loving someone that's, that is on the spectrum in terms of how much you step outside the box to think about things and think about other people's shoes to step in besides your own. Tell us a little bit about um, uh, what you're doing in that regard, which I would imagine for the most part is probably your blog because this is not yeah. the first uh, yeah. podcast that you've been on. Tell us a little bit about that, how it came about, um, what it's about, and what your purpose and intent is with it, especially long term. 
Sure. Um, I have a blog called meomai.ca. Mm -hmm. Which is um, in the chat. Mm -hmm. It focuses on my family life as well as, you know, I have guest writers, um, quotes. I have product reviews. Um, basically, why I got into writing a blog is I just found myself writing a lot. And never a writer. Um, definitely was not a... a a straight A English student, that's for sure. It wasn't my desire back when I was younger, it was to write. And I think it was based on my experience, um, experiences that I was writing down that I realized it was really therapeutic. And, 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 you know, if, if you check out my blog, you'll see there's some deep, deep um, content in there that, you know, left me crying for a long time, but it was almost like a release to let yeah. some of this stuff out. Um, I think for so many years, I felt incredibly alone. Yes. Um, and I couldn't imagine other people to understand my situation or my life or my issues or challenges that I was having with my kids. It seemed so irrelevant compared to the issues that they were having. Mm -hmm. um, I just I just felt really good about writing. So I just started writing and I was encouraged by some family and friends to, you know, you need to do this or write a book. I'm like, oh, I don't know about a book. But maybe I'll start with a blog and see where that takes me. Right. And I think myself, my biggest hope was is that maybe if I'm open and honest about what it's really like for me in my world, um, I will help someone along the way know that they're not alone. Right. Uh, because I really didn't know anyone in the same situation. Um, yeah, I didn't have a lot of resources to go to. It was all new to both of our families, um, understanding the spectrum. I, I had to self teach for the most part. Um, yeah, and I just, you know, I wanna, I wanna share the stories of joy and love and happiness, but I also wanna share the facts that there are really hard times. Um, motherhood parenthood isn't easy right. for any of us um i've always been someone you can you know i'll tell you everything just like it is um with no concerns or worries for what other people are going to think mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully i'll make somebody else feel you know what i'm not alone and you right. know you can reach out to me or reach out to anyone um, the other thing, what I've really learned about having a blog is all the network that networking that i've been doing all the podcasts and the radio and the write, writing and stuff is that it's so nice to have a community or meet people with similar situations. Because even just meeting you, Sean, it was like we just we figure we kind of know each other just because we have that one thing in common. Right. And it, it's, little, it's actually big, right? Yeah, right. We don't have to do a lot of history talking about what it's like. Um, there's different degrees, but we there, we do have and share something something in common, right? Right. Right. Um, and I think, you know, learning that now, almost 20 years later, you know, into it, um, I really wish I had of allowed myself to, you know, join some of the Facebook groups or join this or meet with this club and meet other like minded people or who are people are experiencing and can appreciate what you're going through. So those, really, are, those are things you existed in the beginning then. Pardon me? Those are things that you you resisted in the beginning, then. Totally, totally. Oh, okay. Tell me, I'm that. a little shy, believe it or not. What's that? <laughs> I said I'm a little shy, typically at first. Um, really? Yeah, you just don't know if you fit those shoes. I think you know, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but like, how will I fit in with that group, and how how does that work? And um, I probably overthought things and thought maybe I didn't need the help that I really could have used. You know, right, right. right. Well, I think yeah. that overthinking is part of the human experience. But I was curious yeah. as to what what held you back from that because I felt like in the beginning, and the way my wife and I complement each other is that she is behind the scenes and does research and finds whatever needs to be found and gets things done. And this is where this is. This is where that is. Yeah. You know, the fact that I was the only dad in a mommy and me class. Uh, yeah. I don't want to was like about two. <laughs> is you know she's the she's the reason for that yeah. um whereas i'm going to kind of step forth and you know so i probably joined too many groups to begin with and then you strike a balance because at the end of the day 
people are people. So how, so not only is this, is the spectrum or even outside of autism, each diagnosis different, but how people respond to those things depends on who they were before the diagnosis came about. And, yeah. um, you know, and there's people in varying situations. Like I can't imagine what it's like for someone to not be part of a team and be um, single raising a child on the spectrum. There's people mm-hmm. that are, uh, that are obviously out there and like that, but mm-hmm. it's what we do, what we dare to do is so needed in terms of just letting somebody know, hey, you're not alone. And mm-hmm. like I often say that, you know, your biggest nightmares, biggest challenges, those are somebody else's dreams and they're just wishing that they could be in the same situation. So mm-hmm. you know, what is it that you want the blog to do uh, long-term or what do you want to do long-term uh, mm-hmm. as as far as it, as it relates to your, and it's, might sound like a really deep question as it relates to your role in the universe, generally speaking, but also as it relates to, um, to the special needs community. Well, I'm still trying to figure that out to be all honest, but I do do a lot of thinking because having this blog has, has inspired me to think differently and look at different options and avenues. So I'm really enjoying, you know, these speaking engagements. I'm enjoying, um, writing. I'm excited about the opportunity of maybe publishing some children's books, um, but I don't know. You know, it's a hard one for me, Sean, because, you know, growing up, I never knew what I wanted to be. Right. Uh, I did know I wanted to be a mom, but, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, yeah. I'd like to kick it, to continue and advocate, um, who knows one day, maybe have a store on my, on my blog, on my site. Um, I'm hoping to do something like that, um, that caters to special needs service like equipment that kind of stuff books Mm -hmm. um but yeah i don't know right now i'm just it's one day at a time it's crazy right right Right. i'm just just doing what i can mentally handle and that you know the blog takes up any of my extra time right right that's it i mean it's I think there's a lot of people that that still kind of feel like even people that have achieved certain levels of success. And this is aside from any special needs component, which is like, you know, what do they want to do when they grow up? You mm-hmm. know, um, so I think that that's a very universal uh, predicament or, or spot to be in. And I didn't ask you, what is a, what, what, what kind of business or industry is your husband in? Um, well, he, he's, a consultant and he works very closely with a lot of the first nations um bands mm-hmm. um we both met in the hospitality industry like i said so right. we were both trained hospitality um he was the general manager of a large resort he's been um, a counselor in one of our communities on town council mm-hmm. uh, very active professional i think he's brilliant mm-hmm. um yeah, just capable of a lot more than I think he ever knew, too. Right. Uh, yeah, he's very, very bright. He mm-hmm. wasn't he wasn't very considered very bright when he was growing up in school. He was kind of like that bad kid that didn't succeed and do very well much. Right. Um, but, you know, I think they had him all wrong. I think uh, they, you know, today we're pretty fortunate that a lot of teachers will teach to what works for the children, mm-hmm. uh, especially with our kids. Yeah. And back in that day, that wasn't really an option. It was like everybody learns the same way. And he didn't take to that. That's yeah. for sure. Um, but probably one of the smartest guys I know. I think uh, the further back you go in history, the more wrong they will have. Um, they, they seem to get it in terms of yeah. figuring out our children. And for me, it's like I told you when you when we talked earlier off camera, and you mentioned the genetic testing. I'm curious about that, too, because, you know, I put my parents through the ringer. I didn't get in trouble in terms of yeah. anything with discipline or anything like that. But I hardly missed any school um, physically, but I was almost never mentally there. in the classroom. Yeah. You yeah, put something in front of me. My husband would say probably the same thing. He was not there even when he was there. Yeah. yeah. I was just always, you just, I, I, I couldn't, couldn't hold my attention. So I had all kind of tutoring and everything, and they tried to diagnose you know, a a variety of things. And so what would happen, quite frankly, is whenever I'd get a good grade, my dad would say, do you see this? You could do this all the time if you would just apply yourself. And my brother, who always got good grades and went on to UC Berkeley, um, where he got his degree and then he got an MBA after that and everything. 
you know, and coming from the from the from the Caribbean, from the Virgin Islands, you know, when I was growing up, people would have um, stickers in their cars and their windows with the various um, school that they went to. Everybody at yeah. least got a four year degree, and it was just one of those things that you were supposed to do. So I yeah. really struggled, you know, uh, with mm-hmm. that. So I wondered where those things come from in terms of, yeah. um, you know, diagnosis and everything. So as a result, one of my personal um, aspirations is I'd love to be able to have, I don't know if anybody can franchise a school, but if you have a system by which a school is run, you teach kids to balance a checkbook before they find out by bouncing a check. You teach them, uh, you have a special needs program as well as a neurotypical one or spe- yeah. and aside from special ed. And you teach them that it's okay to go to college uh, yeah. to pursue a dream as opposed to getting in debt just to go. And if you teach them how to run a business, have somebody that has done that, teach yeah. them that. Because in most cases, when you go to a university, an institu- uh, institution of higher learning, the professor that's teaching you how to run a business is not required to have even failed in an attempt to successfully run a business. So, yeah. you know, um, so I- I'd like to be able to do something like that one day. And I'm curious about that and teach each child as they learn. And I know there's some um, schools that do that, but they're usually either private or, 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 or far yeah. and few. But yeah. You know, and you know, I've been I've been doing a lot of research on private schools and uh, schools uh, for for different kinds of learners and neurodiverse students, and there's a lot of them privately. Right. Yeah, it would just be nice if the the public school system kind of t- took on a lot of their approaches. Right. Absolutely. Most of us are in a situation where we can afford private school, especially for someone like you with six kids. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't imagine that. So. Well, that's where everybody, again, I think we all have so much to to add and so much value. And um, that's why an exchange like this is so great. And that's why we have this show because, you know, it's it's kind of like just taking a conversation from a living room or a couch or yeah. for some people a bar stool, I guess, or a curb or a park bench in a setting where other people can hear it and get something from it as well. Because people need to know that they're not alone. People need to be inspired um, yeah. by anything else that somebody else has to offer. Yeah. No but I want to say, I think it was really funny that you mentioned you and your brother. Um, you know, I, I got into the universities I applied to, but opted to go to a college, a two-year program, yeah. and work as on learner. And uh, my brother went to a uh, university and then headed off to Harvard to get his PhD. And uh, we graduated from part of our journeys at the same time. And my mother put our pictures in the newspaper. They had a graduation centerfold in the town paper. And there I am, you know, Rebecca just graduated from hospitality and is heading off to Whistler to to have some fun. (laughs) And then there's my brother who's just completed Um, heading off his doctorate at Harvard. And I'm like, did you have to put them side by side? (laughs) Like we were laughing, (laughs) how different we are. but yeah, right, yeah, right. I, you know what I, I can say, you know, oh, uh, you know, oh, genetically speaking, they got, you know, autism from my husband. But, you know, I'm pretty neurotic and I have my own quirks and um, pretty artsy and creative and all these great things that go into autism. So I'm sure there's a little bit of me in there, too. Oh, yeah. I'm convinced that we all have some t- tiny yeah. aspect um, yeah. of it. Like, I, for instance, if I walk into a room and a painting is like slightly uh, askew, yeah. that drives me crazy. Um, yeah. And again, never had any diagnosis or anything, but there's little pieces of, of it. Like I think, yeah. you know, I, I think in every last one of us, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I have two, I mean, both my husband and my daughter can be very irritable. You know, everything I do, I think annoys, annoys them for the most part, you know, whether it's the way I'm walking or the way my feet are dragging or how loud I have the TV or how though I have this or, you know, the construction outside. Um, yeah, it's, it's right. really humor. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Well, I think we're getting uh, close to our, our, our time. We usually go for, you know, an, an hour max, but I also like to make sure that we take the conversation um, to its uh, natural point, if you will. And uh, I, I still feel like there's more to expound on, um, based on what you you know have to offer i think that you're in your infancy in terms of trying to figure out well what do i want to do with my purpose and and um and and impact the lives of people generally speaking as well as 
people in the special needs community. Please keep us informed so that um, we know when you kind of figure out which direction your heartstrings are tugged in and uh, where you want to go and what you want to do. And um, our uh, producer, Sean Hall, has put um, you in the in the chat. He's got your um, the link to your site and everything. So be encouraged to go there and take a look. Um, we are on uh, Apple Podcasts, and we are actually, as of today, on uh, Overcast uh, Podcast as well. So as we continue to get picked up, we'll make sure that we let people know. I want to thank um, everyone that generally tunes in each week. Robert, thank you so much for um, – for uh, for joining us. And uh, Rebecca, I want to thank you and wish you continued success in each and everything you do. Let's stay in touch. Oh, likewise, Sean. Thank you. Most definitely. And so I want to, as I always do, um, encourage everyone to remember that there's somebody out there that needs to know that you care. There's somebody out there that needs to know that they, uh, that they matter, regardless of wherever you are in life. And there's somebody out there that is depending upon you to be successful. And they may not even know it, and you may never meet them, but you have no idea how even your quest for success will possibly affect them. And I want to acknowledge and thank both my mother and my wonderful wife who are the queens and ladies in my life. And I would not be here nor who I am without either one of them. So thank you very, very much, Rebecca. Uh, keep in touch, everyone. We will see you next week. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Are we still on? <laughs> right now we are, yeah.